Welcome to That Moto Show with Dirt Bike TV's Jay Clark and producer Donnie Bales. Number four of our tech podcast. So, can you guys believe it's already been that quick? It's Before. it's going by quick. It's, it's moving fast. along. Yeah. I, th- I think it, guys have been writing me and asking like how often we're going to do it. And I said, so it's going to be about two weeks. And we're going to start to release this uh, midweek. So, uh, we're recording this one right now. And it's going to come out in a few days from now. So, it takes a few days. And I don't want to push Donnie too much. Uh, uh, you know, it's, he's already getting paid enough. So if we rush it, it'd be even more. So there is a rush fee, <laughs> right? So, so anyway, so now we're going to come out midweek on Tuesdays and or Wednesdays range every two weeks apart. So uh, we just had a mud uh, supercross race. How fun was that? It was amazing. Best ever. Now, unfortunately, we won't have the San Diego info on here. We're looking at the uh, the weather and it looks like there could be some rain. I don't think it's going to be as significant as San Francisco, but there could be some rain to make it a little bit more challenging. So I, I thought it was pretty, that was so gnarly. And when you see the best guys in the world looking like squirrels, uh, Spencer was explaining it like, hey, you understand, like we couldn't even get around the track, like yeah. even a lap. Right? Yeah, I was telling Riley, he goes, they, they look so slow. And I'm like, dude, I go, if I made it around, I would probably fall 20 or 30 times, but I don't think I could make it around. No, not those conditions, not by the mains. Uh, those conditions are so tough. I don't know if I could even ride around without. And once you fall a couple times, your hands are covered in mud. It would be just brutal. It'd be You're terrible, done. terrible. All right. So you guys are doing good. Oh yeah. Ready yeah. to go. Yeah, All right. So let's go. get started. Let's get started right into the questions. We're going to try to keep the shows a little shorter as well. That's our goal. But Spencer's like, then stop bringing so many questions. So I'm going to try to answer the questions as quick as possible. We're giving you the info. If you're not, you can watch this on YouTube. If you're listening, if you can do that. Or if you're watching, you can download the podcast from all your podcast podcast platforms as well. So our Hey, we've got some a goal and getting a lot of downloads. So it's really cool. Yeah, yeah. So we're, the downloads are coming, which is cool. So people can listen to this. So I try to, if you're listening, I'm going to try to explain things as best I can. So they're not just totally visual. And if you're watching, then you get to see, you know, a few pictures and things we show you as well. But hopefully if you're just listening on the way to work, you won't be missing much at all. Yeah. The first question comes from Chris. I'm a first time dirt bike rider trying to get into the sport with family. I recently purchased a 2018 YZ125. I rode the spike at the guy's house and upon returning home, I immediately ordered a top end for it. When I got it all torn down to replace the top end, I found a trash cylinder. Really bummed because I dropped a poop load of cash on this bike and honestly don't have the money for a new cylinder or even a rework slash replated. Do you know the cheapest route to get me a solid deal on a rework or a new cylinder? Thanks. All right. So this is really sad. And I, a lot of times I joke around that dirt bikers are dirt bags. Unfortunately, this happens. And it's like... It, it's a sad reality that a dirt bike guy sold this bike and he had to know. And I have pictures which we'll put on the screen here, but the cylinder was basically worn all the way through. And so this thing probably sucked dirt. And we have videos talking about what to look for on a used bike. But the biggest thing when you're buying a used bike is you're trusting that person. Uh, when I go look at a used bike, one of the things I would do is pull the air filter. You, if they won't let you pull the seat off and pull the air filter off, then don't don't get it. But you can pull the air filter off, put your hand in there, and feel in that air boot if you feel any dirt. That's one thing. Turn the air filter upside down and see if you see any dirt on the inside of that. That will tell you how their, their level of care of the bike, one thing right away. Also, on a two-stroke, it would be really quick and easy to pull the pipe off. If you'd pull the pipe off, you could look in there with a flashlight and see if there's any wear on the piston or cylinder. So this was really unfortunate. There is no cheap, easy fix. And in this guy's case, after looking at the pictures, he really needs to rebuild the bottom end as well. So it's not just a cylinder damage. A Millennium can replate the cylinder. That would be the cheapest and best option. We're not a big fan of doing sleeves. We like to replate it and Millennium does that. That would be my best bet on the cylinder and then getting it like a Pro X rod kit, getting your crank rebuilt, new main bearings, the whole deal. No cheap, easy route, but a two stroke is way cheaper to do this with than a four stroke. So if you're buying a used bike, a two stroke, I tell guys if you're buying one, especially it's a few years old, you have to assume in your price that you're buying it for that it's going to be cheap enough that you could rebuild it in the first few months and still be okay on the price typically an amateur guy not a pro how long would it take them to go through a cylinder like that like how many hours could a bike go if you're doing regular maintenance and changing pistons? Hey, man it can go uh, it can go 100 hours um, I mean, not not on that piston but the cylinder no no be, right changing pistons yeah changing pistons it then can go 100 hours but the things look i sent the pictures to brad and we both kind of felt like hey the thing sucked dirt that's the only thing that really grinds on it like that so probably sucked dirt that's what wipes things out unfortunately yeah so be careful when you buy bikes <laughs> uh mitch w asks jay i was just watching your video on clutch weights and was wondering 
What difference between that and the flywheel weight? Do you use both of them or just one? I'm 53 in Newton Motocross and have a 23 KTM 250 SX. Just wondering if this will help me on an MX track or is it more of an off-road riding thing? Okay, so they can help on both. So if a guy's struggling with stalling the bike and wanting more tractable power, a, a clutch weight or a flywheel weight can help. So that's giving it more tractability, we call it. So it's gonna be like more torque and feel. Now, the clutch weight, we've been using those lately just because it's easier and more accessible than flywheel weights. The problem with flywheel weights is, a lot, first of all, there's not a lot available, but I have heard now that Steely has some for the current KTM four strokes. So a flywheel weight would be much more noticeable because it's right at the crankshaft and the clutch is you know, two away. So that difference isn't as significant. So if you want a bigger difference then you'd want to get it on the flywheel, the clutch weight, we use those Blaze ones and way quick and inexpensive and easy to install. It's not going to be as noticeable, but it does make a difference and less stalling. So either way, track or trail, it does help more trail. I would say overall, less stalling. That sounds good. Donnie. All right. ASAP Huna. What hour mark do you normally check valves on a 450 ridden about two to three times a month? Would you say checking valves is based more on the hour range or do you go by signs that the bike gives you signifying that the valves should be checked? Thanks. Okay, we're going to assume a vet guy like us just a recreational rider taking care of everything never suck dirt again if you if you do happen to suck dirt then i would check valves right away after that but as far as if you know on, and now there's different levels and guys won't like hearing this but on japanese bikes 50 hours i would check them uh, on the on the ktm bikes as long as you don't suck dirt 150 hours now one little thing that'll tell you uh, if you if everything's good in your fuel system and your bike starts to get harder to start then that can be valves. So you want to check the valves. So that's one little indicator that maybe they're starting to get tight that you can feel that. So if it's getting hard to start, I would look at your valve adjustment. Cool. Leo L says, Hey, DBTV pod just found out about it. Love the channel. Such great info. I got a question. My dad has a 2008 KTM 450 XCRW. He didn't really clean his bike much, so his motor cases are stained from the mud being caked on the bike. What do you recommend on cleaning the motor without taking it out of the bike? Okay, this this is doable, but not totally easy. We have a video, if you Google our videos, and we'll, we'll probably have a link, and we can put a link in the uh, the description on this video, uh, and us cleaning an engine on the bench. And you kind of do it the same thing on the ground, just lay the bike on the side. Uh, we can use a mag wheel an aluminum cleaner. First, I would use like an oven cleaner on the engine, a degreaser first, then a, uh, like an oven cleaner, and then like a, an aluminum bright uh, type cleaner, any type of mag wheel cleaner on the engine cases, and I'm scrubbing that with scotch bright, and that's gonna be the best way you can do it. It's flipping that bike side to side on the ground, scrubbing it, and then power washing it. And we have a video that shows that, so that's the best way you can do it while it's in the bike. Yeah, Leo L has Two questions in that in that email he sent you. Uh, okay. He also asks. I also have another question. I mostly do trail riding on my 2015 KTM 350 XCFW. How often should I replace my oil? Okay, this is a broad question because uh, on our dual sports and stuff, uh, we can go, you know, anywhere from five to ten hours just dual sporting, basic, easy riding, right? But then we have a motocross bike. We can get one hour on a on a current Yamaha. But for most guys, I tell them four to six hours. And what you do is you look at that oil. If it comes out really black, then you want to bump up that time frame a little sooner. If it's coming out and it's still looking fairly new, then you can go a little longer. So it's just a simple test and there's a broad range there. But I think four to six hours is a, a good place to start um, if you're just a recreational guy in those conditions. If you're a motocross guy, it's half that for sure. Yeah. Colin, KTM 150SX, I think he, ha he has his bike in his name. So pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think I would put that in my name if I had one bike that I rode all the time. Uh, thought this might be a good topic for that moto show as it's now the snowing, snowing season outside. I'm curious if there's a list of things you would recommend I do as off season maintenance on my bike. Maybe top 10 things to do while I've got the time. Thanks. Well, first of all, we're gonna have to make a video on that specifically. We've gotten that question quite a bit. Now, 
we're not as totally objective on this question because we don't have to do this. Uh, unf you know, there's people that live in places that they need to put their bikes away for three to four months, and we don't have to do that. Now, we'll say that we ride less in the summertime as a whole. We ride less, and so our, our biggest problem for us out west is fuel um, going bad very quickly because of the um, just the terrible fuel nowadays, uh, the pump gas, and, and the excessive heat we have. 10 days, two weeks, you can clog up a pilot jet in a bike. On a bike like his, what I would what I would do during the winter is keep track of your maintenance. If it's time to do a piston, that'd be a great time to do it it's during the winter. Um, if you have batteries, I like to pull those out and put them like in your laundry room or something, mud room in the house, uh, and so they're not so cold out in your in your garage where it's getting well below freezing all winter. So pull those batteries out. His bike doesn't have one, but you could pull those out. Um, also, it's a good time to flush the coolant um, when it comes to spring. If you, now, ideally, I talk to a lot of guys, if you can start the bike once a month, that would be great. If you, so if you do get a warmer day and you want to go start it. And also, I think that would help break up some of that winter gloom is to at least go start it and rev it up, right? Would, don't you think that help? Oh, yeah, for sure. Because you were, grew up in Iowa. Yeah. So, you, you know, it's like. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Just, you know, to smell it. Feel it in your hands, even if you can't go ride it. Right. Snow's covered the driveway or whatever. I, I don't know. I think there's always, uh, unless the snow is like eight feet deep, <laughs> I, I would go someplace. <laughs> right. So anyway, hopefully that helps. We'll we'll look at trying to do a video, a, a legit video on that in the future. But uh, you know, the main things are your fuel. I would dump all fuel out of the bike that you can get out of there. It would be ideal. And, and if you have a carburetor dump it all out of the carburetor and during that winter time I would look at doing pistons and if maybe every other winter you're doing a bottom end that would be ideal if you got the warm place to go do it and you know greasing up your linkage and steering stems those types of things always gonna be great talk about cabin fever when you when you can't ride for four to six months yeah I guess I'd be I'd probably rebuild the entire bike yeah every, every winter every, every winter I would just take it down to the frame grease everything you'd have like, a brand new bike <laughs> the same bike every year be brand new right it'd be all cherry yeah for sure <laughs> all right John R has a quick question is the second nut on the inner tubes necessary? I haven't seen you actually address this before. Thanks. Okay, we've actually gotten this question quite a bit a uh, few times. So I brought a tube in. Um, this is a Dunlop tube, which I do get a lot of questions about these good Dunlop heavy tubes. They're not readily available like at your dealership or anything. MXTire.com has these. Um, and they're not available a lot of other places, but they do have them. So on a tube, as you can see right here, there's a there's a washer right here which seals against the tube, and you have one nut right here. That nut is needed, okay? That has to stay on here tight. I've had some guys see. But when you buy a tube, sometimes it'll have the second nut all the way down touching this nut. So this nut is just to go external uh, on the outside of the rim, and it's to help an install. But it's a little bit confusing when it comes brand new. If you buy a new tube, a lot of times the second nut is touching here. So guys think they need both of them right there, and you don't. So this is how it should look just like this. This is how it should look when it's on your bike, this external, the cap touching. This is a nice uh, metal cap from Works Connection, and you can have just a plastic one, or one like this is really nice, and just have them touching like that, and that'll allow the valve stem to be able to move. So that's a great question. Um, so hopefully that helps you out. Hey, I have those WC caps on all my cars. Well, it's, it's off your uh, 350 right now. Yeah, we, I, we took, I, took I just robbed it off for, the, for, for this video. I, knew I felt some some hurt in my heart. There it something is. was going on. Because yeah. I brought the tube and I was like, I don't have. So anyway, we'll have to remember to put that back if on. If you need a cap, it's not hard to find one of those around here. <laughs> Very That's cool. Awesome. Tyler P. says, hey, Jay, I currently just stripped my motor and electronics off my 2022 CRF 250R. And he, and he has impressed he's powder coating so he's, he's powder coating his frame can you perhaps make a video of reassembly of this unit as i am sure i may mess something up <laughs> donnie's face right now donnie's like so tyler wants me to go get a 22 crf 250 r and tear it down to the frame and make a video showing him how to do it so Unfortunately, I just don't have the time. <laughs> I can't help. I'm sorry. I'm sorry Tyler. I just can't help to do it. Now, here's my other problem: is I don't recommend powder coating aluminum frames. It it looks cool for a bit, a minute, but we've had too many guys who've either anodized or powder coated frames, and they have lots of electrical problems later. None of the grounds are correct on the frame. Uh, the 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 frame grounds through different points on the frame, and not just the coil. So. 
the, I, for that reason alone, I would I would shy away from powder coating and aluminum frame on the steel frame bike, and and also on the on the aluminum frame bikes. There's just no need. You can you can sand them and polish them up nice. They can look so good on an aluminum frame bike. Obviously, we powder coat steel frames, no problems, and you can just clear off the contact points. When that '97 Honda came out with aluminum frame, by '98, it felt like every other person had powder coated their frame. <laughs> You remember that? It's like yeah. everyone, you'd see them all. Oh and that bike was terrible. I oh, got yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was bad. All right, Aaron B., is it necessary to have the carb breather hoses on or will it cause problems to delete them? Yes, for sure, you need them on. And so they actually figured out in the mid nine, early 90s, they, the hoses came straight off like this. Remember, then this, Donnie, remember they, had, they started to make a, a loop around? Yeah, yeah. And that's what stopped the bog. You would get that bog and those loops around would allow it to vent. And if you didn't have those, they would clog with mud and so forth. You'd also have gas oozing out and you'd have a puddle of gas all under your carburetor, which would then stick with dirt and two-stroke oil and it'd be a mess. So yes, you need carburetor vent hoses. It's one of our most common questions, getting that, that Honda part number for those cool hoses would which we have in our Google uh, Doc, which is the first time I've mentioned that in this show, so that's pretty good. It's the longest I've gone <laughs> yeah. without mentioning our Google Doc, but Spencer's been actually working on the Google Doc, got it a lot tuned up, it's a lot cleaner, uh, easier to follow, find stuff, and we're still we're still at it, right? It's yeah. a work in process. But I got yeah. to about the second page and I quit looking at it. We're, we're making it a lot cleaner. It's long. Yeah, we're getting it it's a lot novel. cleaner. Hey, it's nice. It's also those vent hoses, you know, remember, make sure they're either split or you yeah. have a, a cut at an angle. Yeah, show that on the that. videos where you cut them on an angle and we split them too, so that they're slit, so that way dirt can't won't pack in there. And it, if it does, it'll want to fall out. Awesome. All right, what we got next? Howl yes. by Moonlight asks. Howl by Moonlight. Yeah. What are planned mods right off the bat? This is our new 350 XCF. That was our, and, and it's a huge list, man. I can't even say anything, but the, so on our 350 XCF, we, we which uh, Donnie's got. No, that's the that's SXF the, that's behind over him. there. Yeah, it's to my so, right. So the 350 XCF's right it, there on the on computer there. screen. That's Donnie's, and so for ours, it's the twisted ECU. Now the 24 model, we don't have to get air forks finally. So so stoked about that. The 24 comes with spring forks, and so far the the little bit we've ridden it, it's it's awesome. And the suspension guys I've talked to say, hey, it's plenty good. You don't need to go buy a kit or KYB stuff. We're gonna be able to. I kind of wish these spring forks came on the SXF model, so we don't have to do that. So we're doing the twisted ECU. We're going to do the Twisted ECU. We're going to, um, oh, gosh. Oh, we got, we got the 450 clutch. So we're running the 250 header pipe. A little bit better kind of power throughout. And let's talk about this a little bit. This is a 450 clutch master cylinder. And it has a number 10 on it. So I believe that's for the size of piston. The stock 350s is a 9, 09 it says, instead of 10 right here. And this just gives you a lot firmer, stronger feel so you stay off the clutch for guys like me who abuse it a little bit much. This 09 is fine on the 250Fs, totally fine where you want that quick action on the track. But this 10 works so good on the trail and, um, and, and on the track on the 350. So we do that, that ECU, the suspension. Um, what protection pieces we got? Well, we did that. The stock, the the stock uh, skid plate is really stock good. Stock skid plate bolts right up from Power Parts, and the XCF actually comes with that skid plate. So we have that on there. We got our ODI champ bar, Ben grips, recluse torque drive, IMS tank. clutch, IMS tank. Um, we're trying to work on a way to get more fuel from the very bottom because the tank is bigger, but still, the way the fuel pump sits in the new bike, you can't always get all that fuel out from the bottom. So that's a concern. And on bigger rides, we're probably going to end up carrying a little bit of fuel as a backup. Um, Are there smaller bits too, uh, like the chain guide guard? And yep, the chain guard really from Bulletproof yep. and the swing arm guard from Bulletproof. Um, and we picked up brand new AT82 Dunlop tires going on that thing. And then this, the 350 XCF I'm building right now is a Dunlop themed AT82 bike. We'll have that, uh, we'll have some pictures of it and then by the next a show or two from now, we'll have that to show. So it'll be pretty cool. So yeah, 350 XCF, very excited about it. It's always cool getting a new bike and just pick that up. I actually think like, you know, first, you know, I was a 450 guy before and then once I started, you know, GL let me ride his yeah. 350 the first time. I'm like, this is amazing. You've been talking about it. I honestly believe that that XCF is my favorite bike of all time. Yeah. I, it's so much fun everywhere, and it's like, you know, Glen Helen, Cahia, off road, works racing, NGPC, whatever. It like covers all the bases. You know, we always say Goldilocks, and yeah. and that's a common question I get is what bike I should buy, and all the time I would say for when the guys write me what they're doing, I go, what are you guys doing? Okay, I'm doing this, I'm doing dirt roads, I'm doing some track a little bit, and I'm doing these trails. 350 XCF, 350 XCF. It's it's so common. 
as i get older i think the my favorite parts the kickstand yeah so 17 2017 and up is what i would recommend if you're going to go 350 xcf a lot of guys who are new to it are buying some of these older 350s 16 and older and it's really not a great bike big unfortunately difference. big difference big so, difference. so so even a 17 is fine there's a few little quirks the fuel pumps go out and everything but that's you can get that fixed and move on but 17 and up is just fine for a 350 XCF. Yeah, but the reality of it is and everybody says this bike that bike all bikes inherently have something that isn't perfect right and so you know if we're going to nitpick everything well then you're going to find something wrong with everything that goes for cars right i mean every 100%. new car you, you don't get a car that you go five years and you know it's got to get back in the dealer for this this valve or whatever went listen out. i've had five or six motorhomes i say every one of them was built on a friday <laughs> for sure <laughs> <laughs> All right. What do we yeah, got next? So this, it's about time for a product spotlight. You kind of did a product spotlight with your clutch, but this next question, you can combine the product spotlight with this next question. Oh, okay. you'll, you'll see how. What? Justin B asks, do you have a video or can you help me with fork, height, fork ride height positions? Where should I set my forks and the triple clamp? I have a 23 Gas Gas EC250. He's an intermediate rider. Okay, so uh, so first of all, on fork position, I'm not a big tuning guy, but the, the rule of thumb is, so the lower the forks are, so they go out flush, they come flush with the top, and most of the time, a lot of forks, like the KTMs, have lines, one, two, three, and those will be, you know, two or three millimeters apart, and you can measure those, and, and so we usually are in first or second line when we set the forks, and, and so if you're at the track and you're on a tight track a lot, then you want those forks up higher, and that's gonna let the bike turn better. So like on two or third line, your second or third line, that's gonna let it turn better. If you're riding faster stuff, you're worried about head shake, then you wanna get them flush you know, on the first line or flush. And what Spencer's talking about with our product spotlight today is calipers. So it used to be back in the day, only machinists, and that's what I did a long time ago, used to have calipers. But you should have a set of digital calipers are very easy and inexpensive to buy this is just a set from like Lowe's these cobalt ones I've had these for a long time I have a nice set in my machinist box I have a nice set of uh, other ones some Starrett ones uh, but these are very easy to read and follow you can set zero even if you aren't very mechanically inclined you can buy these for like 30 or 40 dollars now a good set of these keep them in a case in your box and you can measure bolt lengths it's very important one little trick we do spencer's looking up when we were messing with the bike yesterday that 350 which bolt goes where because we have it all laid out we're new to that bike we go over to the microfish to the parts finder on the computer and we go oh the bolt for the tank is supposed to be this long we know it's 12 millimeters long okay boom quick easy fix right so simple you, that way you have the correct length bolts in the correct spots because if you do it just however then you get to the end and you're stuck with a short bolt and you're going to strip something out so keep the correct length bolts in place H having calipers will is is very important for guys to be able to just be more precise in what they're doing and what spencer's actually talking about with forks we'll actually measure the fork height with our calipers if you want to get really exact most guys eyeball it with that line on the forks and some bikes don't have a line so it becomes much more difficult and you can check them with a ruler or calipers is much more exact so don't forget to the sag right height of the rear end affects the front end and even the tire uh, wheel distance in the swing arm for sure all that's going to all jive together you know um so we like to set the the sag um most of the suspension companies give us a rule but i'm usually on the little bit lower end i do like them sitting down a little bit just to kind of what the so way I 108 would you be running a lot uh, 105, 105. To, to 106. Doesn't it feel like the sag actually got shorter they used to be like always saying 110 and yeah then, and, and then it kept getting some, short. Like some of the yamas and stuff they want like 100. yeah and it's like wow that's crazy yeah all right thomas g Howdy, I'm just curious. My Thai FMF has gone dull blue. Is there a way I can get it back to a nice shiny blue? Thank you. Yeah, buy a new one. Uh, that's about it. You're going to buy a new one. Now, we do have a really cool little video that we did on Donnie's bike, and I'll have Donnie show a picture of his that we vapor blasted after it got scratched. It got scratched really bad on a trail ride uh, incident where he screamed like a little bit of a girl. I didn't scream like a girl there. It was when my foot got stuck. <laughs> oh, that was a different one. It was right before that one. He dropped it off the cliff, right. and I okay. had to save his bike from. Rolling you all the dropped way. it off the cliff. Well, it was gonna. It was gonna, it was gonna go, go off with anyway. or without right, me. I got gotcha. you. So I wasn't sad. I was happy to <laughs> oh, be there. I, I mean, no, it was. It was a fun trip, regardless. Yeah. So that muffler was a was a pretty blue, 
and it was new. So we just sanded it and then took it to our Vapor Blast buddy, Vapor Blast it, and now it's a cool looking dull silver. Honestly, it could not have turned out any better. It looks like it titanium. Looks, it looks factory. Does it look to titanium? Me. Totally. Ti yeah. Okay. So anyway, I wish there was some magic way you could make that blue better, but nothing else. Uh, sorry for you. So um, you just got to get a new one or fix up your old one as best you can. I think the silver looks fine. Uh, I would do something like that. And the nice uh, thing about a, a person sticker. like you is you're not worried about trying something like this. It's like, how can uh, we make this better? And it's, you know, a lot of guys when they've just spent $750 on just uh, an exhaust, they're like, uh, even though it's scratched, they're afraid to touch it. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, that brings up a good point. One of the biggest comments we get lately is I cut up the air box on our YZ250F. Yeah. Everybody's like, I hacked it up. It's like, it's a $30 part. Right. We're testing it out. I don't care what it looks like. It's not well, visible. And not to mention you have tuners like Jamie saying, let's get more air to this thing. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. All right. What do we got next? So that's Tegan M uh, says, I was curious if some 2007 KTM 250 XCFW wheels would fit a 2023 500 EXCF. So absolutely. One of the greatest things that KTM has been good for is over the last 23, four years, wheels all the same. I don't even know how far back you can go, but I know from 2000 up, so 24 years, um, it's probably even older, but they're all the same wheels and fit up just fine. The only thing you have to change is spacers. So you have to change out spacers. And on the 23 and 24, the new model, um, it's best to get these Nackstar and make some spacers that go in further and give it some more support if you're going to run an older I had old wheel. wheels I put on my bike and I just got his Those spacers. spacers and they were yeah. perfect. Done. Like wasn't even, an, it felt factory. Yeah. It's awesome. All right, Alex Z, what type of Rotella oil do you recommend using in my 07 YZ250F? T4, works great. We've been using it a long time. Picture Is here. T4 only uh, one weight, it's 1540? No, there's there's another one. So we just do it in that 1540. Okay. And we'll have a picture that you can just check it out. And we, we get it at Sam's Club. It's with what we found the cheapest in the States here. Um, guys in other countries, they, they run into roadblocks. I don't know what to tell you, unfortunately. I got it at Walmart a bunch of times for $12 yeah. a gallon. Yeah, that was pre... The thing we can't say on YouTube because then they get... Yeah. Picked. Yeah. But uh, free home staying event, yes, something that one, that one. So those those days are over. So we pay around fifteen. I think is about the cheapest. I think we get, we pay a gallon if we get like the case with three three gallons. A we time. need to buy more. There's only four left underneath the. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Hey, oh, yeah. I found them in two and a half gallons too. That's it, we've gotten those and it's we, kind of a pain because it's because it's the, such a hassle. It's so big and yeah. you're no, like, no, no. I keep the old bottle. Oh, and pour and in I the gallons. Put them in the uh, gallons. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're not that smart. Okay. KCM says, Jay, a.k.a. Tire Changing Lord, watch your recent Bib Moose install vid. What would be best for me? I ride a KTM 500 Dual Sport, 90% dirt road, or sorry, 90% dirt, 10% road. I ride occasionally, maybe seven times per year if I'm lucky. Desert, riding, trails, Idaho, gravel roads, paved roads, in between trails. The bike sits for weeks at a time sometimes. I love the idea of a moose insert, but it seems like maybe with my variety and the fact that if it sits for prolonged periods, it'd be better of just running a heavy duty tubes. What are your thoughts? Thanks. Yeah, so I did write him back and, and in his, what he already answered kind of his question is that his bike's sitting too long so that the mooses are going to go dry and flat spotted unless you have the bike on a stand. So mooses are great and I tell guys they're great if you're riding regularly and are going to want to maintain them. So they're a ton of work, um, but they are great. Um, but they take more work to deal with and you need to be riding often. Um, the guys that use them, like our buddy Kelly changes them, but he's, he's riding multiple times a week. And when, he's, when they start to go low or flat, he, he pulls them off. He'll pull them off and the tire's fine, pull them off and add a piece of moose in there. Just stuff another piece, put it back. He's good for another couple weeks. What's the price range for a moose? They're, they're 150 range. You know, they're expensive. More than the actual tire. Oh yeah, many times. Yeah. yeah. So most guys, most guys will get two mooses on a tire, but yeah. So it's an expensive commitment, uh, depending upon the qu you know quality of moose. And MX Tire does have mooses, the Dunlop good mooses as well. But a good heavy duty tube, properly powdered, can go really well. And we also have videos on double tubing with a stock tube with it. And like I said before, we only have we ride quite a decent amount, probably more than he what he's saying off road. And we we average one flat a year. And we've been doing a lot better now that we're, uh, Spencer's getting older and wiser. We're just not aiming for stuff. We, we do pretty good. And the, another big thing is checking tire Spencer. pressure. 
<laughs> checking yeah. tire pressure before you ride. Reckless. A lot of guys go out, they, they, they think the tube is it, or they're running a thin stock tube, and they go, tube, they get a flat, tube suck. So what's a good tire pressure off-road to, to help prevent from flats? Well, you're gonna be, you, you don't want to be too much uh, high, you know, lower than 13 because of the, getting the flats, and you want to be higher than 14 because of the performance loss. So 13, 13 and a half off-road, uh, just fine. Now, when we're doing our slower stuff, like in Moab and Green River and stuff, with our, say, our gummy tires or anything like that, we, we, we'll go down to 12 or even a little less and be fine. Do certain off-road tires help prevent flats? Is there anything tire well, stronger tires, that's, that is a thing. The Dunlop tires are a lot more stronger sidewalls, typically. So if you're running a very thin gum, you know, a thin tire without much construction, yes, it's much more likely for pinch flats, for sure. Adam S. says, Hi, Jay. Do you have Brad's contact info from Parapros? I want to get some engine work done on my bike. Okay, so we've gotten this question a lot. Brad um, works on just engines and carburetors, those types of things. So you can ship him engines. You can send him carburetors. Uh, you can DM him at Parapros on his Instagram. Or if you email us, I'll be glad to send you uh, info and do an email intro with him. Um, so if you're local to SoCal, we're in Minifee area, that, that does help for a lot of guys. So hopefully that 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 helps you out there. And he and he's great. I mean, uh, and and the the other big question I get is people asking if I do work and I don't. And Brad does nearly all my engine work myself. It, he does it because it's all I can do to keep up on all the work that we're way way behind on as it is, and still trying to ride and do this kind of stuff and fine. So yeah, yeah. That's about it. Well, CD time. Oh, that's it. All right. So CD time. Today we have White Snake's album. Now this is really David Coverdale's band. It really is kind of a a solo band, you know, so to speak. So we got. Oh, I, Donnie, I got to put my glasses on to to read the uh, yeah, to read yeah. the songs. Okay, so let's go over this. This is 1987. Really good year, by the way, right, Donnie? Yep. Crying in the rain. Bad boys. Still the night. Here I go again. Give me all your love. Is this love? Children of the night. Straight for the heart. Don't turn away. It's nine songs. That's all it had to be because it was nine amazing songs. Like every one of them's good. You can just yeah, listen to this all thing. So good, really good. Kind of like a black and black, which we'll talk about another time. But uh, it, it would, every song just goes, and there's no throwaways. When you can just listen to it and go, you know, that also feels like it had way more music videos. Like every music video was like good to that album. Yeah, they did like five or six. Yeah, it was it was incredible. I've heard a few stories on some of the songs. Like now he tells now he's he's, he's in it in his late seventies. Uh, David Coverdale is, and a couple of those songs were written and were going to be sung by um, Tina Turner. Like they're like love songs, you know, yeah. and uh, you, and it's pretty cool that he didn't, you know, that, that he ended up using them, right? Uh, yeah. So anyway, just just a really cool album. If you're looking for an amazing rock album, 1987, White Snake self-titled album, um, that's what they just call it, and this was just incredible at that time. Great album. What else we got, Donnie? What did you, you got a question? To I got a question. Us out? All right, here yeah, we go. Yeah, I got a question for you. Spencer's out. It's not for him. Not for just me. For you. No, okay. just, for, <laughs> just for you. So, how many bike builds do you think you've done? Number one, and do you have a favorite, or is there a top three oh. favorite bike build that you have? Something that you went from. It, it could be even like the retro stuff where they were just junk and you made them perfect. But is there a favorite build? Not necessarily a favorite bike to ride. Oh, so man. how many projects do you think you've done? You know, gosh, we, we, we average around 20 a year, and that's been the last 20 years. So I've been doing this 30 years, so it's the last 20 years in that range. So that's 400, right? 400. And so I think it's somewhere over that. It could be okay. more. Yeah. yeah. So it's I, I can't even get into it. So and that so that and when it's so that when you do that many of something, that's where it becomes like, what's your favorite? Yeah. I don't know. They, you know, whichever one I'm riding right now. Which, KX500? Yeah. So the KX500 and and the Yamaha we did, the older steel frame Yamaha we did with you, those were pretty fun. And the KX500, um, because I was reluctant uh, to no. do it. <laughs> I forced him into that's it. A, that's a nice way to say reluctant. Yeah. I was it forced was more him into than it. That. He, you know the first video we did with that? <laughs> we tore it down, and it's probably one of the funniest things he ever <laughs> said is he goes okay it's uh he said uh, something to the effect of it's a lot of work not for donnie <laughs> but for me <laughs> i think i've laughed at that 10 times <laughs> it was a fun build uh, we'll have a link to that in our uh in hey a, in but that video. thing turned out oh so ridiculous good. and it's cool that we you know that we kept it so yeah. you have it here we bring it out to the we'll bring it out to the two-stroke race here in a couple months at yeah. Glen helen it's fun to have people kickstart it we had it at the langston show a couple months back so it's fun that we've kept it 
um it, it, luckily it's not you know going to be sold right away and with something we can enjoy um you know I, we want to do another video with it because we added that recluse we're going to probably all go out to Glen helen when, yeah. when we can we should all go out there and do some laps on it at Glen helen it'll it be it just fun. shines at Glen helen too there a couple of times i wrote it there i I'm not fast, but I just remember coming out of the corner before the big hill, and I was next to a 450, and I just it was just gone. <laughs> yeah, so that's what, so I'm looking forward to that. So we're gonna we're gonna get out there and do that soon. So I guess that kicks for at 500. There was a 91. And we did a ton of updates with um, TMR did the engine and uh, kicks guru guys they yeah. helped us a ton with logistics on. Resto, you know. It's a resto mod. Yeah. And it came out amazing with a lot of updated stuff. People ask us, it's completely not financially uh, feasible to do what we did. No. So that's what people ask. Now, that's another problem that leads into a whole other thing of these, these old bikes that we build. A lot of them don't make financial sense. So I tell guys, it needs to be, make a sentimental sense to you to want to fix up a, you know, a 95 CR250 or whatever. It was your dad's bike, your uncle's bike. It's, it needs yeah, to be something sentimental. Don't get into it for the money. Right. So you know, you're going to be lucky to break even if, if you're lucky. So it needs to be something you enjoy and want to build for a reason. So You know, so, I got that bike from Grant at Red Bike. Yeah. I remember that was a cool story yeah, to, so. from, from there. So anyway, that's a cool show number four. Hopefully you guys all enjoyed it. Um, remember to like, comment, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. Share it with your buddies. We got a lot of comments of guys saying, hey, I share all your stuff with my buddies. So hopefully you enjoy. And uh, if you're in the winter areas, you know, doing your winter maintenance, I, I'm sorry for you. Um, but hopefully, winter, you know, that, you know what, what's, the, what's the groundhog's name? Uh, uh, Phil. He should be showing his head soon, and hopefully it's, it's ending soon for you guys. Pantatai, so. Phil. There we go. <laughs> All right, we'll see you guys. Thank you. Bye. We work with some great companies, and here's a list of those right now. Dunlop Motorcycle Tires. Wysco Piston. Vinco Air Shocks and Dirt Bike Parts. FMF Exhaust. Decal Works Graphics. Pro X Racing Parts. Recluse Clutch Revolution. Motion Pro Specialty Motorcycle Tools. Works Connection, Uni Filter, Klotz Oil, Cometic Gasket, MX Plastics, JE Pistons, Cardo Systems, ODI Bars and Grips. And remember, if you shop Rocky Mountain, use our link from our site, Linktree, or link in the description of the videos. Thanks for watching and listening. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.